Hi, I'm Laura. Thanks for coming to dance with me today. Today, we're gonna to be talking about swing. So Louis Armstrong said, if you don't feel it, you'll never know what it is. Duke Ellington told us that it don't mean a thing if we don't have it. But what is it, where did it come from, and how do we do it? Note, I'm not a musician, but I do read and write music a little bit, and I understand some music talk. I'm also not a musicologist, so the information we cover does not come from my own study in the field. But I've read a bunch of books, and one of the books that was really influential to me was Gunther Schuller's Early Jazz. It's amazing, it's linked in the description. A lot of the information we cover in this video comes from that book. To understand what makes swing special, let's compare it to European classical music, which was the dominant musical form from the Western Europeans that had settled in the United States at that time. So let's do a quick overview of how this particular type of music works. What the musicians see is something called a measure, and in our music, that measure is in something called 4-4 time, which means there are four beats, Per measure. You put two of those measures together, you have an eight count, that's what the dancers listen to. So in a lot of classical European style music, you have a strong beat, which is the one and the three, and you have a weaker beat, which is the two or the four. If you think about canon D, that's a good example. Pachelbel would be pleased. Another difference with European music is that a lot of European classical music, harmony and melody are more important than rhythm. If you contrast that with African music, rhythm is the most important thing. And you can really hear that emphasis in a lot of the music today that comes from African roots. Not only was rhythm the dominant feature, but it was incredibly complex. So for example, in a seven part ensemble, six of the seven lines may operate in different metric patterns, which are moreover staggered in such a way that the downbeats of the patterns rarely coincide. I feel like this almost never happens in the classical music that I know. Typically, every Everything comes together at the downbeat, which is the beginning of the measure, beat one, or at the phrase, or at the chorus. I feel like my grasp of rhythm is not strong enough to really understand music, where you have all these rhythmic lines that continue over hours and only intersect a few times. That is mad complicated. Now you have that African musical tradition and you bring it forcibly to America via the slave trade. In this new environment, these musicians don't have access to the freedoms that they used to have or the instruments that they used to have. So of course, certain adjustments need to be made. The adjustment to the white man's music consisted precisely of translating these polymetric and polyrhythmic points of emphasis into monometric and monorhythmic structures of European music. Syncopation preceding or following the main beats was the only workable compromise. This syncopation preceding or following the main beats is something that Gunther Schuller is calling democratization of rhythmic impulses. Meaning instead of having a strong beat and a weak beat, that one, three, one, three, you now have an emphasis on the two and four as well, so all beats are strong. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to clap on the two and the four if you're listening to jazz music. Duke Ellington has this wonderful description on how to snap to music. You should definitely check it out. It's in the description. Schuller says that three things were accomplished by transforming against the beat accentuation into syncopation. One, he reconfirmed the supremacy of rhythm in the hierarchy of musical elements. Two, he found a way of retaining the equality or democratization of rhythmic impulses. And three, by combining these two features with his need to conceive all rhythms as rhythmicized melodies, he maintains a basic internally self-propelling continuum in his music. All three are qualities survived in jazz as swing. Internally self-propelled continuum. That is that internal metronome that jazz musicians and dancers really strive for all the time. And you can see that link. It would be impossible to participate in African musical concerts if you did not have a strong internal sense of where that beat was, especially since it's not reinforced by any of the other instruments. So you can see that this beautiful, intricate, complex jazz music that we listen to today is actually a huge simplification. I think that's amazing. Now I wanna take a second to clear up a misconception that I hear about a whole lot, which is Africans brought rhythm and then Europeans brought melodies and harmony. 
Something else that Gunther Schuller brought my attention to is that the conception of melody in jazz and in blues is also very specifically African. They have this concept called blue notes and blues scale, which did not exist in the European tradition. European musicologists would go to Africa and study them, but study them with the mindset of a European musicologist. So you would hear these notes that exist outside of the normal notes that we have, and the Europeans would think, ah, this is the note that they meant. They must be messing up. I'll go ahead and write it down in my language so I can understand it. Also, when Africans were taken from Africa and brought to the United States to be enslaved, they didn't have access to their instruments. They had what? European instruments, which were designed in the European system to only have those very specific tones. Now, of course, not everything is totally alien. You have certain things like octaves, which just sound good no matter where you are. So they could definitely co-evolve. But you can see that these African ideas, after going through some adjustments, are the main components of blues and jazz music that we know today. So now you don't have to be a musicologist to be a good dancer. So let's talk about how these ideas apply to to dancing and how to visualize swing in a way that may help your dancing. Now one of the primary ways that we as Lindy Hoppers embody swing is through that triple step. So basically you have the beat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then you have between the beats. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight. That is a straight beat because that subdivision is right in the middle, right between those two beats. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight. So for swing, you take that subdivision and you push it out of the middle and closer to the following beat. So it sounds like one and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight. How far do you push it? That varies a lot between band to band and between tempos. There's no right answer, which makes these musicians even more amazing because you have like 18 of them on the bandstand and they're all listening to each other and collectively deciding where that swing should be. What we want to do is we want to be able to listen to their decision and try to put that in our bodies as best we can. So let's start out just clapping out that difference in an eight count rhythm. So straight, we've got doesn't change, but that in between the beat changes. Let's try doing that same thing, but with our feet. So let's start by doing that nice swinging rhythm that we want. We have a five, six, seven, eight, a boom, So let's make this easier and better. So if I think about just doing this rhythm with my feet, it'll look like this. One. complicated, that is out the window. For me, just doing it from the knees down is too complicated for me to really do it. So how do you do it? I think about putting my rhythm in my butt. So if I set this and I think about leaning on one leg and then I think about keep on going, we got, hey, ho, ha, ho, focus on that leg. Get it. So 
something else that makes it easier for me is when I take a step, I try to commit all of my body weight into that step so my butt is right over my foot. I feel like that keeps me nimble, it keeps me balanced, it helps me prepare for things really well, and it gives me an accurate gauge of my momentum because I'm more in touch with my hand, which is the thing that's in touch with my leader. Something that makes it harder for me is if I have a little bit more of a wide stance. So in eight count rhythm, if I do this, hey, ho, hey, ho, this makes it a little bit more difficult to feel committed and it feels a little bit weird for me to bounce in this kind of wide stance. Another downside is if I take a step that's too big, hey, boom. I'm not gathered, I'm not balanced, and I've decided how far my leader wants me to go without really accurately taking the step that relates to my body that my leader was hopefully asking for. All right, but what if you really need to move across your room? Your leader has given you a lot of energy. Wouldn't you need to take big steps then? So you can see, even if I'm moving really quickly, boom. Hey, um, uh, the sizes of the steps themselves might still be big, but my emphasis is to still stay gathered and keep everything small. Now, of course, this is technique that works for me. It might not be perfect for you, and I don't do this technique all the time. There are lots of different moments where I have my feet wide and I'm gearing up for a redirection or something like that, but in general, when I'm taking progressive steps, this is something that I try to do. Swing has this beautiful emphasis in horizontal propulsion, so you can see how this is such great music to dance to. It's music for dancing. I hope you thought this video was helpful. If you have questions, leave a comment if you want to support my channel click subscribe or head on over to my patreon and the best way to learn how to dance is just to do it a bunch dance it out